okay. And everyone should see the little little pop up. So okay, I think yeah, we'll we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and get started. But uh, yeah, so our final lecture of the day will be uh, Zach Sullivan telling us about heavy quarks. And uh, Zach is uh, one of the CTEC members. And uh, so pleasure to have you here, Zach. So we'll turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's always fun to uh, get to think about some of these things at, uh, at these uh, summer schools. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk to you about heavy quarks, but I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what heavy quarks are, but I really wanna try to think about what we can use heavy quarks to do. And I'll take you through a specific example uh, to understand uh, the types of physics that we can learn about because we have the access to heavy quarks. So just a brief outline, and I'm, we'll see what this is as we go along, but I'll start off by just saying a few words about what heavy quarks are, and maybe a couple different ideas of what we mean by what heavy quarks are. And then I'm, uh, most of the uh, talk I'll be, uh, lecture I'll be discussing how to use these to kind of go beyond sort of the basic uh, physics that you've heard about so far. All right, so what about heavy quarks? What are they? Well, the first heavy quark that was found was the charm quark right, that was discovered in 1974 by both Brookhaven and Slack, and they published back to back. Uh, one of them called it a bound state of a charm quark, the J, the other one called it the psi, so it got called the J psi. And its mass was about one and a half GeV, and that was heavier than a proton. And so that seemed like a pretty good idea for saying this was a heavy quark. Now this charm quark was uh, actually uh, anticipated and hoped for. Uh, uh, Glashow, Iliopoulos, and Mayani uh, noticed that uh, they could solve a problem that had existed in the QCD at the time, which wasn't quite QCD yet, uh, which was that nobody could find any flavor changing neutral current decays of strange quarks. Right? The strange quark did not seem to decay to a down quark in a pair of neutrinos. But if you had a charm quark, then uh, because of symmetry, which we now understand much better with the standard model, it uh, forbid a direct decay uh, to this state. Uh, another sort of side note is that, uh, at least from my perspective, one of the other nice things that happened when this was discovered is it started to loosen a little bit what I call the shackles of the eightfold way. All right, so Gilman had this sort of semi-mystical uh, idea that you know the flavors were related to this SU3 symmetry, and this was everything, and everything was going to be symmetries. And you know this is a very powerful idea, uh, but you know it was at least a little kink to start, and it wasn't until much later that more kinks started to show up. All right, but in 1974 the charm quark was discovered, and you know here I show you a picture of the spectrometer measurement of one of the experiments that. Uh, saw it. And the very, the problem was that immediately there was a problem with this, which was that it was clearly a bound state, uh, but its width seemed to be incredibly narrow, right? All the particles that people knew about, the rho, the omega, the phi, they all had widths that were in the several MeV. And you have this J psi had a width that was in the KeV. And this actually caused a bit of consternation in sort of this early days of QCD. Uh, but Appelquist and Pulitzer realized that uh, this bound state of the J psi, if it decayed through a strong process, had to go through at least three gluons, right? Now, the model they actually used was a positronium-like model. It's, you know, this is based on, you know, early ideas of heavy quark effective field theory and so forth. But the reason this was a solution was that if you decay to three gluons, then you can just count the number of gluons. Each one, when you square the diagram, gives you a power of alpha strong. And even though alpha strong is not that terribly small at the uh, level of the J psi mass, it's small enough that if you multiply through together the numbers, you actually get the right value. All right, so, you know, often when a new heavy quark is discovered, something interesting comes up. Uh, this was something that sort of spurred people to think about how to actually uh, do these heavy, these QCD decay calculations in a more effective way. Uh, 
Uh, something to think about maybe for later this afternoon for me or tonight for you is, you know, why don't we see JSI going to two gluons, right? It seems like a lot of gluons in the final state. So just something to think about. Well, the very next year, of course, the tau was discovered uh, at SLAC. And at this point, people sort of had started to see this structure of the standard model that we now know for the, you know, if you like, uh, uh, standard table of particles. And so they immediately knew that all the other particles had to be there. And so they started looking for them. And sure enough, two years later, the epsilon was found, which was a BB bar bound state at the Fermilab Tevatron. And it turned out also to be very narrow. But by this point, um, because we understood the gym mechanism and we understood that there were these extra symmetries that suppress things, it, it didn't shock people as much. And of course, once you have a bottom quark, you had to have the other half of this doublet. And so people immediately started looking for the top quark and they found it. And well, it turned out they didn't find it. And then they found it again and it turned out they didn't find it. And this went on for several years, all the way until actually 1992. So I was an undergraduate in 1992, uh, getting close to graduating. And one day my, uh, I can't remember which class it was, might've been quantum mechanics. Uh, professor came in and slapped down a transparency of this and said, this is the top quark. And this is one of the things that really got me excited about uh, going into particle physics, you know, going then on to grad school and eventually becoming a particle physicist where this was the very first event that was found uh, at the Fermilab Tevatron, right? This was CDF and they had just installed a silicon vertex detector that I had actually helped put together. And out of it, the, what they saw was an event that had two jets uh, they had that were coming from the primary interaction point. They saw an electron, a positron, which was very well measured. They saw missing energy, which is denoted here by the neutrino. And they saw two other jets, which seem to have displaced vertices, all right? And displaced vertices are a good sign that you had either a bottom or a charm inside of your jet, because remember those widths are very small, so they travel a long way before they decay, all right? So this actually turned out to be the, the best measured event they had <laughs> almost through the first run of the Tevatron. Uh, but this was the discovery of the top quark, and you can see the mass was 170 GeV, it took, the reason it took so long was it took a long time to have a, enough energy in a collider to get to that point. So what is a heavy quark? Well, generically speaking, you might, you know, the first thing you might say is, well, a heavy quark is any quark whose mass is much greater than lambda QCD, which is, you know, order, you know, 100, 150 MeV. All right, so here I've just listed the masses from the part, most recent particle data book. And you can see that the charm is about 1.7 and the bottom is about 4.8 and the top is, well, it's maybe about 173. Uh, one thing I want to just have you keep in mind here at the moment is uh, just be a little bit careful about these masses in the particle data book. Uh, I'll come back to why, especially for the pole masses in a moment. Uh, but just experimentally, I just want to remind you that the Tevatron found the pole mass of the top quark to be 174, whereas Atlas and CMS are finding it to be about 172 and a half, call it. And this weighting in the particle data book is mostly weighting based off of the LHC data. But if you look at, stare at these error bars for a moment, you know they're more than a couple sigma apart. Uh, and this actually is not the only measurement that differs by that amount between the Tevatron and the LHC. Uh, the W mass is small, alpha strong is small, uh, the decay rate to muons is smaller. So there, there are a lot of systematic differences between what happened at the Tevatron and what's happening at the OHC that I don't think are really fully understood yet. So for myself, I would say the mass is somewhere in this region. And even so, it's measured very, very well. Uh, but just be a little bit cautious. Don't over interpret uh, these uncertainties as are quoted right now, because there's probably some extra missing systematics. Now, I've also mentioned two different masses here, the pole mass and the MS bar mass. The pole mass is real, what we normally think of as what would be a physical mass if quarks were physical. Namely, it's the pole and the propagator. It's the thing that kinematically is, seems to be propagating through space-time, right? It's what drives kinematics. 
there's another mass here, which is listed, which is the MS bar mass, which especially for the charm in the bottom is much is better measured. These are related to each other for through a formal uh, calculation. You can do this. It seems kind of funny to have two different kinds of masses, um, but there's a reason for that. Uh, and we'll come back to the, the reason in just a moment. But again, you know, what is a heavy quark mass? You know, the, the general expectation you say is, well, you know, it's some parameter in Lagrangian. After all, if I write down my Lagrangian, I have an explicit mass term there, right? For the top quark, it'd be mt times tt bar, up to some coefficients. And that's an okay answer, um, you know, and it's useful, especially if that quark is heavy, because you can uh, create a heavy quark effective field theory and expand in inverse powers of the mass to do especially uh, non-relativistic calculations. Uh, now, as a theorist, you might, I might say, well, maybe a slightly better answer is that after all, masses are actually not the primary thing, right? One of the most important predictions of the center model is that the masses of particles are actually artifacts of dynamical interactions, specifically with the Higgs, right? So from that perspective, uh, this, the top quark mass is actually an effective Yukawa coupling, right? And, you know, again, interestingly enough for the top quark, that Yukawa coupling seems to be coming out to one to a shocking number of decimal places in the standard model. And this is really actually the thing we'd like to understand is to, conf is to continue to confirm these relationships that so far, at least it looks like for the top quark, this is correct. And maybe the bottom quark, uh, maybe even the tau, right? So, uh, one of the big things the LHC is working on is confirming this Yukawa mass relationship and confirming this prediction of the standard model. Now, a third answer, and this is one that you that I think an experimentalist might reasonably make, is that well, you know, it's the kinematic mass that we see. After all, this something like a top quark will decay to particles we can reconstruct, and you can reconstruct the invariant mass. Um, now, there's one little challenge with this, which is that right after the discovery of the top quark, uh, Martin Smith, uh, who was a colleague of mine, and Scott Willenbrock, uh, asked sort of this, this particular question about the pole mass of the top quark. And what they discovered is that there's a formal problem in the definition of the pole mass. Uh, it, there's something called a renormalon, and it, it leads to an ambiguity of, of what you even mean by the pole mass when you're talking about quarks of order lambda QCD. Now, why would you care about this? Well, first of all, remember, that's sort of order 100, MB, 100 150 MeV, so there's a, an unbreakable ambiguity of that order. But it turns out that actually using the pole mass is even more problematic because, for example, if we do build another linear collider and try to look at extracting the top quark mass from, say, threshold, uh, it was discovered uh, back in 2001 that if you try to use the pole mass for your calculation, basically, as you go order to order in perturbation theory, the position of that threshold bounces all around all over the place, right? Why is this? Well, as I say, it, it, the pole mass itself is not well-defined beyond lambda QCD. In fact, you could argue it's not really that well-defined at all. Uh, but remember, a, a quark is not the same as an electron. An electron, I can take, I can set on a scale, and I can measure its mass. But a quark, you can never separate for an infinite amount of time from the QCD interactions that will cause it to bind with something else. And so you always have some amount of QCD interaction uh, due to the coupling of other quarks or antiquarks that have to neutralize the color uh, that confuse information about it, right? And you can't get away from that. On the other hand, uh, in this case, uh, it turned, you, you could, it was discovered that it, you use a different kind of mass. In this case, they use what's called a 1S mass, sort of a pseudo bound state and do, again, a heavy bound state mass-like calculation, you actually can get a very stable mass. And the reason is technical, but essentially what happens is these renormal on ambiguities cancel at the first couple of orders and it gets pushed off to a higher degree. So the error is not order lambda QCD, it's order lambda QCD to some power over the mass that you're calculating. 
And so you can numerically suppress it smaller than what you want to try to measure. And so if you do any plus and minus a collider, you could get to at least 100 MeV uh, by examining threshold. All right. Well, this also shows up if you use the MS bar mass. And so this is actually why we quote MS bar masses. It also gets pushed off to higher orders. And so Marty and Scott said, well, since this is the case, we really should just be using MS bar masses for all of our quarks, especially the top quark. Of course, now we're all theorists and theorists like to you know, make these pronouncements because it makes our theories look nice. Uh, but of course, that MS bar mass is not what's measured, right? You measure something much closer to a kinematic mass unless you try to extract it in a secondary way, for example, measuring a cross-section and then looking at the dependence of the cross-section on the defined mass in your theory. All right, so you can get you can measure an MS bar mass, and it has been measured, uh, but it's it's not a direct measurement anymore. It's a fit of a theory calculation using the MS bar scheme that gets rid of this formal problem, and then you need to get enough data to be able to measure that other observable uh, to a better level. All right, but what I would say is that you know these are all great definitions of a heavy quark mass. But I think for the purposes of this talk, what I want to point out is that really what's important about heavy quarks is that they're adding a new scale to your problem, right? Adding a new scale to a problem both complicates the calculations that we're doing, but more importantly, it adds new insight, right? It's great to discover a new particle, but you know we're not in th this business for the most part to discover new particles. We're in this business to take those new particles we discover and use them to understand something about, for example, dynamical interactions. The thing is, uh, if you have a heavy quark in your final state, it might be useful or it might not. And the, real, the key to that is really context, right? So anytime you, you look at any observable final state, the real question is going to be, what are the other scales in the problem, right? Maybe this heavy quark can tell us something very deep about physics. On the other hand, if we think about mass corrections, generically speaking, they go sort of like a mass squared over whatever the natural scale in the, in the process is squared. Most of them do. And you know, if you're going to high energies in a high energy collider, that decouples away numerically. right? So for example, and here's something else to think about later. If we think about the decay of a top quark, it decays in a two-body decay to a bottom and a W. And if we ignore the bottom quark mass in that decay, you can ask yourself, well, how big a mistake am I making? Well, you can show that the terms that are proportional to the bottom quark mass can be factored out to go like the bottom quark mass or the top quark mass squared Right? That's about one over 35 squared. So it's an order, it's an order of 1% correction if you just drop those terms. Right? So that's something that's good to be able to convince yourself of. Right? And this is a fairly common thing to, to do. Right? We generally ignore quark masses in the proton when we pull it out. Why? Because we're at energies much, much, much greater than those quark masses. So it, it's a reasonable thing to do. It's a small numerical effect. All right, so the rest of this lecture, then, what I want to look at is, well, there are other types of mass corrections that come in, and the ones that are really interesting, the ones we tend to learn things from, are actually ones that go like a logarithm of a ratio of scales, All right? So, for example, a log of the, of the top mass over the bottom mass squared. All right, so how do we use these heavy quarks to go beyond sort of the basic QCD we've seen so far? Well, first of all, let me just remind you of what you've seen already, right? In the lectures by Soper and Naj, you know, they talked about if when we measure an observable, right, a real physical thing, we like to break this up into various pieces that we can calculate. All right. So, you know, we break this calculation into an initial state, which is uh, based out of part time distribution functionals, right? And all those initial state infrared singularities get swept into these things. Now, these, of course, are not physical because we're making some arbitrary separation here. Um, but there's something that in within a given scheme, like, say, the MS bar scheme, we can extract into something that we can put reasonable uncertainties on. Right? 
Uh, the current standard tends to be the MS bar scheme. Uh, I'll mention again later, there is an older scheme called the DIS scheme that turns out to actually be ambiguous if you allow for heavy quarks. Um, the other middle piece of this is the matrix element. And this, of course, you know, when you're taking classes is what you spend most of your time learning how to calculate, right? We learn Feynman rules, we learn how to calculate all of this. The phase space breaks things up. And this is actually important as well, because so you don't necessarily, generally speaking, you don't integrate out an entire cross-section. You do things like jet counting. Well, that's an exclusive cross-section. That means you're putting cuts on your cross-section and that actually affects what you can do theoretically. And then finally, there's you know either fragmentation functions or jet definitions, and these are actually formally required once you get beyond leading order, or if you don't completely integrate out uh, your cross section, right? Because again, you end up having to do what's called coarse graining in a more solid state picture, in order to average over uh, the uh, information leaving your state and this is what hides the final state infrared singularities all right so you saw uh, some great lectures about this so far you also saw some very detailed lectures about drillian and deep elastic scattering right these are the traditional test beds that we use to understand qcd right we study drillian because it concentrates all the qcd information in the initial state and so you can really study what's going on in the initial state we also look at E plus E minus to jets, and that's just, if you think about it, the, uh, uh, just flipping that diagram around, it allows us to study just final state information. And deep and elastic scattering really is, you know, this is like the experiments at HERA, it lets us really understand things like proton structure and fragmentation flow and how color flows through diagrams and so forth. And you even saw a, a little bit of the factorization theorems of this in the lectures before. Well. This is all was designed and set up in the realm of light quarks. Right. So it turns out that if you want to add heavy quarks, they also can show up in these types of processes. Right. Probably the most important of these was the production of what we call single top quark production. Right. So to an experimentalist, a single top quark production is, well, I see a bottom, the charged lepton of missing energy that reconstructs to a top quark mass and maybe an extra jet or two in the process. This was actually uh, one of the first events of single top quark production. And this was produced by an up quark coming in, exchanging a W, that W hits a bottom quark that turns it into a top quark. And so you have a top quark recoiling, it's a light jet. Notice that this looks like deep elastic scattering, All right? So, you know, from an experimental point of view, it's a little bit more complicated to reconstruct in the final state, but it's basically just DIS. But to us theorists, this actually uh, is a very interesting process that isn't just DIS, but it's actually turned out to teach, to teach us a lot about what's going on underneath the hood, All right? So first, let me just point out that this has actually turned out to be generally true, right? Once I add a heavy quark, uh, I now can affect both drill yan, right? There's a single top quark in the final state. This is now a generalization of drill yan that also allows for charge current exchange. In that case, I have a top quark recoiling as to bottom quark. Or I can do this DIS-like process, but in fact, it's double DIS-like because through next to leading order, there's an exact factorization that separates the top half of this diagram from the bottom half of this diagram. And these processes actually experience different scales. The top half experiences the DIS scales, the virtuality Q squared of the W exchange, whereas the bottom half uh, experiences essentially the heavy quark version of DIS, which is Q squared plus the top quark mass squared. All right. Now, this factorization is exact in next to leading order. It's approximate orders higher beyond that, uh, though there are uh, estimations of what can happen in next nexting order if you could exchange gluons, uh, and they're numerically very tiny. So even uh, you know from a, a numerical point of view, this survives to higher orders as well. The reason I say this factorization is exact between uh, at ne uh, next leading order is that basically color conservation forbids you from exchanging a single gluon, right? And you can think about why that is. You'll prove that to yourself. It's a very simple proof. And so it, 
uh, this then gives us a way to sort of think about heavy quark effects on DIS in a uh, particular experiment or in the theory. All right, well, why was this useful? Let me take a step back in time now, 25 years, to how people used to think about the particularly what I'm calling the T-channel process. Because if you think about the structure of the proton, you say, well, after all, the proton is mostly a glue ball. And so you can imagine pulling out a gluon that splits to a BB bar pair, and that B gets hit by W and becomes a top quark. And this is by around 1996, how people thought about this process. The thing is, if you do this calculation, this process gets a power of alpha S from the gluon, but it also gets a logarithm that looks like that Q squared plus MT squared, right? That's the thing that I said is the, the heavy quark version of the DIS scale over the bottom quark mass squared, plus other corrections of order alpha strong. Now, why is this? Well, I, again, you saw this for light quarks, but if you look at this internal B propagator, you can just write it down, expand it out. I chose some particular frame just to make this easy where the, where the gluon's coming in on the Z axis. If you measure the momentum of the outgoing uh, B bar, you can express the four momentum of that B in terms of the gluon, the B bar through energy momentum conservation. And you can go through the algebra, you can calculate what the dot product is. And it's roughly speaking, the energy of the gluon times something related to, again, uh, something related to the transverse momentum of that outgoing B squared plus its mass squared, right? And the key is this ratio. Why? Because remember, this is showing up in the denominator. And eventually, I might want to integrate over that particle. And I integrate it down to whatever cut I make in that particle. And if you do that, you get an explicit logarithm. All right, so you get a logarithm that goes like the log of one over whatever the cut is you put on that bottom quark to see it plus its mass squared. All right, so if you do this exact same procedure, but on the other side, you get this Q squared plus MT squared uh, when you look at the W. And what you then end up with is the massive formula for deep elastic scattering. Namely, the cross section is going to go like alpha strong times the log of Q squared plus MT squared over whatever cut you put in that B plus the B mass squared. Well, now if you look at this, notice you have many scales in this process, right? You've got the Q squared of the W, you've got the top quark mass squared, the bottom quark mass squared, whatever cuts you put on it. This is a lot of things to keep track of. There's a lot of ratios of potentially large numbers that can destabilize your perturbation theory. Now you can get rid of one of these if you completely integrate out that B bar, and that's essentially what I did here. You're still, however, left with multiple scales. And this is a problem because remember the top quark mass was about 35 times the bottom quark mass. And so numerically, this log is very close to one. That means, and even worse, if you now go to the next order of perturbation theory or any higher order, that same alpha S times log combination shows up at every order. And so your series is not convergent. So how do you get rid of this? Well, it turns out you can resum all those large logarithms, right? And this is something that is generally going to be a useful thing to do when you end up with these ratios of log sc large scales times alpha strong. If you use the DGLAP equations, it turns out that you can resum all those logarithms into a bottom quark PDF. Right? So if you just imagine that that bottom quark comes from a gluon splitting, and we don't expect there to be any intrinsic bottomness in the proton, and even if there is, it's going to be numerically small, so let's ignore it for now. You can calculate the probability that a gluon splits to BB bar, and if you just integrate over that probability, you construct a bottom quark PDF that's proportional to alpha strong, times a logarithm of the scale at which this is measured over the bottom quark mass, times a numerical coefficient times the gluon PDF. And this is actually the procedure that we use to construct any heavy quark PDF, whether it be the charm, the bottom, or in principle, the top, though in practice, we don't use the top, but I'll explain why in a moment. 
But this really works. And this really does mean that now, if you think about the bottom quark, it's intrinsically itself something of order alpha strong times the gluon times the logarithm of the scale you're looking at or the bottom quark mass. And you can show that this is true even when you go to high orders numerically for various values of x. You basically get a straight line if you divide out by this uh, right side, right? So it's a direct proportionality and the number in front of that proportionality is just related to integrating over this uh, splitting function, all right? And so this is what we do in the MS bar scheme. We define these heavy quark PDFs, which for us, fortunately, we sum all these logs. We also uh, define that this heavy quark PDF is zero if you're below the quark mass scale. After all, we don't want to run into problems with this logarithm. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, this will also, we originally tried to do this for the DAS scheme, the confusion came in because it's not clear how to define it. Uh, traditionally, the DIS scheme says that F2 should be zero. However, uh, you can't set F2 equal to zero and set this quark equal to zero below threshold. It over constrains the problem. Uh, because there's a formal, again, there's a formal mathematical relationship between F2 in the DIS scheme and in the MS bar scheme. In the MS bar scheme, this wouldn't be zero below zero. All right. And I just mentioned this as an aside because actually the first attempt to do this kind of thing was done in what was the DIS scheme and it turned out the calculation failed because of that ambiguity. All right, well, once you do this, you now have a new leading order and you've done what's called improved your perturbation theory. All right, and this is in fact what led to the introduction of this nomenclature of calling this a T channel diagram because you're exchanging a W boson in the T channel. And if you do this, of course, then you can calculate higher order corrections. But now, as it's an improved perturbation theory, you've integrated out all those logs of mt over mb squared. And so when you add back in the diagram that corrected for that, you have to subtract off the part you already put into the BPDF. And that leads to a secondary type of corrections that go like one over that large logarithm. And then you have all the normal alpha strong type corrections, uh, but you can now create a weld con, uh, convergent perturbative series, but it has now two different types of corrections with respect to leading order. All right, well, you've got this new leading order. You can now also you know, think about this for, the S, uh, for this type of diagram. And if I'm gonna call this T channel, I'll call this S channel, uh, this drell yam like process. And these things are really very useful because if you know what the pole is in the leading order propagator, it actually teaches you a lot directly about kinematics. Just knowing this tells me, for example, where the recoil jet is going to end up in my detector, right? If this is a T-channel pole, that means that this quark wants to go down the beam line. And so if I look at the leading recoil jet against the top quark, it wants to be very, very far forward. And so that's actually the, one of the most important distinguishing features of T-channel processes. S-channel processes, on the other hand, wants to produce relatively spherical uh, events. And so the B-jet ends up fairly central, right? Now, if there's a top quark ch charge conservation. This was in, I, I did this for uh, the Tevatron, where it's proton, antiproton. It means that the top quark wants to be slightly to the positive rapidity. The bottom quark is slightly the negative rapidity. Uh, but it's a fairly central distribution, right? So just understanding the kinematics teaches you immediately a lot about what events should look like. But this is not just a math trick that I use to get rid of a bunch of large logs. This now really fundamentally changes what we think about the proton and you know, how it's structured, right? This valence picture of the proton isn't complete. We talk about PDFs, but really think about this, right? The point about this is that what you see as the structure of the proton is an energy dependent question. As you go to lower and lower energies, you start to resolve more and more structure of this proton. And all I know about that structure is that if I put in a probe, I can pull something out. And that thing that I can pull out could even be a bottom or a charm quark, even though a real bottom quark, remember its mass was almost five GeV and the proton is one GeV. 
All right. So we really need to take the existence of heavy quark PDFs seriously. But remember, the PDFs are not real. All right. And this is a very important thing to remember. What was real? What was real was that observable. And that's why I showed you that decomposition of the cross section at the beginning. What you measure is something real, like a cross section or F2 structure function or something like that. And then we arbitrarily decompose that observable cross section into a part that we call PDFs, a part we call matrix elements, and so on. So saying that you have bottom and charm quarks as parton distribution functions is a perfectly reasonable thing. It's because we're absorbing all that part of our calculation into what we call parton distribution functions, all right? I'll come back to this, but it's important not to treat these things as real, <laughs> right? They're related to real things in a direct way in some measurements, but they themselves are not real. All right, now again, I'll come back to what happens if you attach too much of a reality condition to these PDFs. All right, let me just make a statement about the top quark as a part time. Generally speaking, we don't include the top quark. And the reason is simply, again, a question of scales. Right. Remember, the top quark mass is about 175 GeV, and we just simply aren't at experiments that are high enough energy to be able to treat it as if it's effectively massless. Right. A few years ago, Dawson, Ishmael, and Lowe actually looked at this even at a 100 TeV collider and found that even for, at least for inclusive cross-sections, it still didn't make any sense. Uh, however, it does maybe start to make sense if you want to look at more differential distributions, like if you're looking for a charged Higgs boson, it turns out to get the high PT tail of that charged Higgs boson, you do start to get large ratios of scales again of the PT over the top quark mass squared sitting inside a logarithm that has to get resummed and exactly the same sort of resummation I talked about needs to be used. And so you want to construct a top quark PDF in that case, all right? But at least for experiments we have today, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so the PDF, uh, the PDFs that you have generally don't have top quark in them. But it goes even way beyond this, all right? It actually now allows us to rethink several processes, all right? So for example, uh, Higgs production, all right? If I was doing Higgs production in supersymmetry, it turns out actually that the largest production mode comes from bottom antibottom fusion, not from gluons in the initial state, right? At least if tangent beta is more than just a couple, right? It also turns out there are very important processes you measure at the LHC that are best described by having a charm or a bottom initial state like Z plus heavy flavor. This actually affects the LHC luminosity monitor uh, and it is a not perfectly controlled uh, systematic uncertainty in that monitor at the moment. It also shows up as a very large background to Higgs production, Z or plus jet or charm plus jet. And just W plus heavy flavor plus jet turns out to actually be the largest background to single top part production. But this also influences your calculations, all right? If I look at, for example, the Tevatron and looked at Z plus charm and did a leading order calculation of Z plus charm plus some number of jets and look at the N jet distribution, one jet would be Z plus charm, two jets would Z, Z plus charm plus jet. But if I go to the next order, I would actually get a bigger cross section in the two jets, All right? Now, why is this? Well, it actually comes back to thinking about parton luminosity as a trade-off against power counting and alpha strong. All right, so this is, uh, you know, you have to be really, really careful here. The PDFs can actually overwhelm the suppression of alpha strong depending on the particular process you're looking at. And when you have heavy flavors, this is not an uncommon thing to happen, right? In fact, when you go to the LHC and look at the Z plus charm plus jet or Z plus B plus jet, depending on your cuts, and these are not unreasonable cuts, you can actually end up with Z plus zero, Z plus one, and Z plus two jet cross sections all being the same. That should make you think about, well, if that's really the case, normally the way that I order my calculations are to add a jet, and you know, I say, well, each one is new jet is suppressed by powers of alpha S, 
If I'm in a kinematic regime where this is happening, what's leading order? All right, it requires a little bit of thought. In fact, it requires more than a little bit of thought. All right, so, you know, the fact that this, this sort of thing can show up, uh, it turned out that uh, it's not just in the PDS we had to worry about, but also in the matrix elements, All right? Uh, there's really, it was a question of, you know, if I go to high orders, I can now in this T-channel diagram, I can kick off that B and I wanna measure these cross sections. Well, the distinction between the S-channel process and the T-channel process was the S-channel process had a B in the final state, the T-channel process didn't at leading order. And so if you look at exactly the top quark against one jet, this is how you're gonna experimentally distinguish them. But sometimes this B from the high order uh, showering of the top quark can end up in, in your sample and fake the S-channel process. And the question was, well, what was that contamination? Once I start measuring it, now the full log comes back again, and I have to be very careful. How big is that? Uh, and there are other problems, right? I mean, eventually this will start to be confused with TT bar. And in fact, there are kinematic regimes where this single top process is actually more important than TT bar, especially if you go to very large invariant mass. All right, so we need to be able to calculate this. Now, I'm not going to go through these techniques in detail uh, because you've seen this already. I just want to point out that 20 years ago, none of the techniques of doing this existed. <laughs> and in fact, some of the techniques that you're using today were created specifically to solve this problem in single top part production. All right. So there are two general classes. One are called one general class of these techniques is called face-based slicing. The other general class is called uh, the dipole formalism, which is basically a subtraction method. And you know, I just want to remind you, because I know this was gone through earlier, that really the essential challenge of doing higher order calculations, and here I'm just stopping next thing order, but this is true at any order, is really how do you deal with those initial or final state soft or collinear infrared divergences? If you do a calculation uh, and you look at an invariant, uh, invariant um, mass between any two particles, then that will go in your calculation like one over the energy of the two particles times one minus the cosine of the angle between them. If one of those particles is a gluon, of course, that can be, give you a soft singularity, or if the particles get too close together, that gives you a collinear singularity. The phase-based slicing methods basically deal with the way these divergences by introducing arbitrary cutoffs to chop out these regions. And so if you have a soft singularity where the gluon energy is going to zero, you just look at the region where some of these invariants in the final state, here I've got two invariants and plotting against each other because I have three particles in final state. You just chop out that region. If it's collinear, you chop out being close to either of those regions. If you're away from them, it's perfectly finite. You can just do that calculation. When you do that, you explicitly introduce a logarithmic dependence on these arbitrary cutoffs. Now, what's different when you have heavy quarks in the final state is that instead of having one minus cosine, you have one minus the speed of that quark times cosine, and so there's no collinear singularity. This makes things technically challenging when you have both types of singularities in your process. You have to be very careful with keeping track of where the singularities are coming from. Nevertheless, if you add all this up, this has to give you an infrared safe observable, like say a cross section, and you can do that. Here it is for single top quark cross, the single top quark cross section. Uh, and when you add it up, all the logarithmic divergences you artificially introduced cancel out in the sum. The two body calculation diverges logarithmically in this, in this uh, arbitrary cut. The three body diverges arbitrarily in that cut. But when you sum them all up, uh, all you're left are is a, is a power series in delta, and as you take delta small, it basically goes away and you end up with a stable calculation. And this is great, but it takes, it, the smaller you make this, the longer it takes to do this calculation. And that's the real challenge of uh, doing a lot of these uh, calculations. The other thing that was originally created by um, uh, Stefan Weinzel to actually solve this problem is what's called the massive dipole formalism. Now that's not, his version is not the version people use today, but it was the first version that was created. Uh, 
The idea there is that when you do a calculation, you have real emissions, you have virtual diagrams, and they have different numbers of particles in the final state. Each of those is divergent, but if you sum them up, it gives you a real observable cross-section. And so what you do is you basically construct some function that has the same point-wise singular behavior that you expect in D dimensions from the real emissions, and you subtract it off, and then you add back in the integration over one of the variables to the virtual piece, such that each of these two pieces is now itself finite. And this is very nice because then it makes it very simple to add to a Monte Carlo, for example. All your terms are numerically finite, and so it's easy to add in. The tricky bit is that it's you're canceling these singularities at every point in phase space. And so you need a lot of sampling of phase space to make sure that when you do this, everything adds up. Nevertheless, it works fine. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this just for time, but uh, here's actually the real difference explicitly in what you're, is actually going on under the hood between the two different classes of diagrams. Essentially in, in subtraction-like methods, dipole-like methods, you end up with something that goes like a pole of one over epsilon times the evaluation of a function at its endpoint. And you basically just subtract that and add it under the integral so that uh, you integrate out uh, this function, it cancels off that singularity, and then you're just left with some an integral you have to calculate, which is finite up to at least your machine, machine precision. Whereas is in phase-based slicing, you actually do what's called a Maclaurin expansion around some, like I said, that arbitrary cutoff at the endpoint, delta. When you do that integral, it gives you that explicit logarithm plus a power series and delta. All those logs disappear when you add up all the terms and the power series terms go to zero uh, when you take the coupling small. All right, well, doing all this basically led to one of the early explicit calculations of what is needed for experiment. Namely, in experiment, you don't measure the total cross-section. You measure a cross-section against, for example, a certain number of jets. So here I've just listed for, you know, cross-sections from the Tevatron. The numbers aren't important. But what is important is to notice that, okay, I can distinguish a T-channel cross-section from an S-channel cross-section by counting the number of B-jets in the final state and the relative proportion of events that I see there and the, those number of B-jets versus the total number of jets in the final state, right? This is a real experimental observable, right? And I have uncertainties on that. Furthermore, I have uncertainties to the top quark mass and scales and PDFs and the bottom quark mass and so on. Uh, something that I think you should actually ask yourself is, you know, we theorists vary our scales to estimate uncertainties from higher order corrections. Why do we do that? Does it make any sense? So it's a question you really should ask yourself and we can discuss it later. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, these PDF uncertainties, this is actually the first set of PDF uncertainties we had using the uh, equation for PDF uncertainties because it turns out that we actually learned a lot of things just by doing examining this process. We not only created B PDFs, but it turns out actually the equations that you use to calculate PDF uncertainties were also invented to, cal to fill in basically this column of this table, All right? We saw that we, how we can deal with multiple scales. We figured out how to do improved perturbation series and have multiple expansions. And it turns out we had to think about something that wasn't really fully thought through at the time, which is how to do fully differential jet calculations. So what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that we also learned something by studying this about the final state, which is that when you do higher order calculations in the theory, you're not in calculating improved quarks, right? I'm not calculating the down quark coming out of this. What you're actually calculating are jets. These are extensive objects, all right? And we sh really should know this from quantum field theory itself. Quantum field theory tells us that we cannot resolve those quarks inside the jets. So if you look at side, you, know, you look at the output of your Monte Carlo, you say, well, there's all these particles. We see all the structure inside the jets. But remember that's being faked, <laughs> all right? When you do a calculation, 
you are literally what's called coarse graining over some physical region of space time. That means you've averaged out an information, it's gone. Now, what we've done since uh, in more recent years is to say, well, maybe we can shrink the size of that averaging and so retain some of the structure that's larger than that averaging that we must because of quantum field theory, but smaller than the size of the typical jet that you reconstruct, you know, with, whose effective cone size is about 0.7 or so, All right? And so we look at the radiation pattern of QCD and try to uh, allow you to put that back in. But generally speaking, what's being done in the Monte Carlo is an approximation that's been fit to data that tries to put back in what that structure tends to look like on average, all right? It's not you know, what you would get out of a theoretical calculation, all right? And just to drive this point home, I just wanna point out that really bad things happen if you try to treat quarks as being real, all right? right as being the thing coming out in the final state. If you take that theoretical calculation and think that what you're calculating are high energy quarks. So let's just, again, go to this T-channel process. Remember we said that we have say a down quark reoccurring as the top quark. And if I say, well, my next to leading order calculation, which allows gluon emissions and so forth, calculate the next to leading order uh, PT spectrum of that down quark, you basically get nonsense, right? Here's that PT spectrum. If I look at low energies, this is all over the place and this isn't as bad as it is. This is just a handful of calculations. I got a completely nonsensical answer at the low end. But even at higher PT, well, it doesn't look like it on this scale, the deviation between different calculations is well beyond uh, what you should expect from different scales. Basically, what I'm saying is it's just completely nonsense. So what are, you, what are theorists actually calculating once you go beyond leading order? What you're calculating are jets, real physical observables, right? And this is the same thing that you measure, right? What do you measure in this process? Well, what you measure is the highest transverse momentum jet that recoils against the top quark. If I take the same theoretical calculation I use to try to predict this D jet, what I get is a perfectly stable uh, prediction and the difference between orders in the shape of this PT distribution are smaller than the intrinsic uncertainty in the calculation. Why? Because it's completely driven by kinematics. It's something real, right? The leading jet is something that is a well-defined object, right? So really the point here is that when we do these fixed order calculation theories, we're predicting jets. We're not predicting quarks. On the other hand, when I look at a Monte Carlo, I put in a hard matrix element it then adds some showering that gets reabsorbed into a jet. But now I want to compare that to a theory. That means I need to be very, very careful how I match what I see in a Monte Carlo to my theoretical calculation. At the lowest level, I have to make sure I use the same jet definition in both. But when I go to higher orders, I can have different numbers of hard jets showing up. And that's what then leads to needing to do matching inside of Monte Carlos. Right? And you have to do it taking into account the fact that you're matching jets, not particles at a lower level. Right? So that's why you've also heard lectures on this. But that brings me to just a point I want to make, which is that generally speaking, you know, us theorists, we live up here in the clouds and we do all these very formal calculations, whereas the, the your experimentalists you know, are really down in you know, making real measurements, right? real salt of the earth type things. And the, we want to be able to put these things together. And of course, the way that we do that is through event generators, right? So the light and enlightenment of theory shines down, but it doesn't quite reach the earth. And you build up from the experiment. And where you meet is inside these big black boxes that we call event generators. And so part of what we're trying to do with this school is open up the box and notice that, well, you know, there are slight differences in the way that we think about things as theorists and experimentalists, and these adventurators have to, you know, make these things meet, <laughs> right? And there's a lot of art as well as science to this, and uncertainties that can bite you if you're not aware of exactly how this is trying to get these things to come together. <laughs>
All right. And I just want to sort of finish up with that point of a place where that kind of thing can bite you, which is that if I now think about event generators, what do I do? I, let me take my leading order process again and just stick it into something like Pithy or Hairwig. If I did that, remember, I could have gotten that extra B jet uh, coming out that would interfere my experimental analysis. If I let the event generator generate that, I run into a problem. Why? Well, after all, that B that comes out can be very hard. And furthermore, this was related to large logarithms that were coming in uh, and so forth. And so if I just compare the distribution that I've got out of Pythia or Herwig by sticking in that as a leading order process from what I get from the next order calculation, I just get completely the wrong distribution, both in pseudo rapidity and in transverse momentum. So again, the lesson from here is that you need to take away is that an n jet calculation plus showers is not the same thing as an n plus one jet calculation. Right. Again, if you try to emulate a higher order calculation by showers, if everything in the event has light quarks and the pole structure is simple enough, sometimes you get lucky and this works. But if you have any other scale on the problem, generically, it starts to introduce logarithms that come in and you really need that full higher order calculation, which you then again need to match back on to your Monte Carlo. Right. And so again, that's many schemes to do that have proliferated. And that's why we had the le lectures by Husha and, and Plitzer. Right. There have been attempts to improve at least this specific problem uh, by Naj and Soper, and they do show some, pro some promise. Right. But this is not a fully uh, baked into what we have available today. All right. So I'm coming to the end of my hour. And so let me just sort of summarize with. The kind of things I was trying to get across because there's, you know, there was a lot of information, but really my goal in this lecture was to expand the way you think about things a little bit, right? We talked about heavy quarks and the sort of the usual definitions, the Lagrangian and so forth. But I think really the most important thing about having heavy quarks in a process is this point that it adds additional scales and in particular induces additional ratios of scales into your cross sections. And that means that uh, certainly from a theoretical point of view, but also from an experimental point of view, that affects kinematic observables and how you try to calculate them. Either from the calculational side, because it induces, tends to introduce large logarithms that appear in the ratios of these scales, or from the experimental side of these things, which is that these things feed through and your calculations become very sensitive and can be less stable than you naively think just by running a Monte Carlo. And generically speaking, these large logarithms look like the ratio of that scale over the quark mass. All right, so if you get away from that, or you get away from that, plus maybe a cut in that scale, then you're in a kinematic regime where you need to, you need to induce a little more thought and not just rely on a, a a theoretical calculation or a uh, Monte Carlo output, right? You really got to confirm that you're not being affected by these types of things, all right? Nevertheless, I also want to point out that, you know, when we've seen these kind of things, this has often actually helped, often been a hint to tell us there was something else to be learned, right? I showed you many types of things you can learn, right? But there are other places these types of logs show up, right? Something else to think about, maybe ask yourself before the recitation is, you know, where are there other ratios of scales that show up with quark masses or maybe just generically ratios of scales that show up that lead to large logs that you need to think about how to resum that might affect kinematic distributions in what you're trying to measure. I just want to conclude by saying, you know, for several years now, I, I've tried to convey that I think something like single top part production specifically has sort of become sort of the new version of DIS and Drillian, right? And the reason is simply because, again, it introduced these extra hard scales, but it ended up leading to new understandings about every single piece of what, how we define this cross-section from changing how we think about part and distribution functions, creating new methods to calculate matrix elements, 
And even how do we chop up phase space? Do we need matching? All right. The Tevatron couldn't have done their, have, couldn't have discovered this process if we had not come up with early versions of jet matching to the Monte Carlos. Right. Something I didn't really have time to touch on, but it's something else that you might want to think about for tonight is that in some of these jets, you can have heavy quarks, right? B jets, charm jets. And those jets are really not like light quark jets at a low level. So one thing to just sort of think about and discuss is how is that, all right? Is this affecting things like your jet energy resolution constructions uh, and other techniques, all right? Is that maybe a systematic error that might be underestimated in some of our experimental analyses, right? So how are these things different and how could that be leading to those influences? And that's all I have and we're exactly at an hour. So these are the questions that uh, are also uh, on the slide for the recitation session and I hope we can have some discussion on them uh, during the recitation later. So thank you. Very good, thank you, Zach. Um, yes, so uh, we do have questions for all the uh, from all the speakers for the recitation. So I encourage you to take a look at those. If there are any uh, pressing questions, we have a few moments we can take those now. Otherwise, we can save those for the uh, uh, for this evening. So um, anything pressing? I don't don't see any hands at the moment. Okay, so I guess we'll we'll close for now, and then we'll uh, have a nice break. Uh, you can take a look at the notes and the uh, uh, questions online, and we'll see you at twenty hundred uh, euro time in the recitation. So, Zach, thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to seeing you later. <laughs>